Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our refuel video series. Tonight, we are in week seven out of 12 for our Acts of the Apostles series. And last week, we were in chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we talked about Peter's miraculous escape from prison. And homework was that you were to read chapters 12 and 13. We did not cover any of chapter 13, but I hope you did read chapter 13 because we're going to need to do a little bit of a review to get us set up to what we're going to talk about tonight. And tonight we're going to be in the very last part of chapter 14 and almost all of chapter 15 is what we're going to cover tonight. So at the very end of chapter 12, let's just do a little bit of a review. Um, Luke recorded that the church in Jerusalem was sending Barnabas and Paul up to Antioch to send them on a missionary journey. In fact, Luke records that John, also called Mark, was going to go with them. And remember, we talked about last week how John, also known as Mark, wrote the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it was his mother's house, Mark's mother, Mary. It was her house that the church was meeting in, fasting and praying for Peter's release from prison. And it is suspected that this is the house, the upper room of Mary's house, that Jesus and the disciples met for their last supper. Well, here I am today. I am on location in Antioch. In Antioch is kind of a central location for our lesson today and for our story that we're going to talk about today. Well, Antioch is a place that the earliest Christians came from the persecution in Jerusalem. When the persecution in Jerusalem really started to pick up, uh, a lot of these Christians left to go to neighboring cities. Well, Antioch was one because it was a large trade city. It was easy to kind of go undercover there and it was easy to fit in there. And it was a great place to start a new growing church was in Antioch. Now, Antioch is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It's 16 miles inland from the Mediterranean coast. It's actually right along the Orontes River, which is now modern day Turkey. So it's a great city because it's on the Orontes River. You can take a, a boat with trade from the Mediterranean coast down the Orontes River to Antioch. And then from Antioch, it was right along a major trade route uh, where camels and horses and you know, wagons and things could travel on that route. So it was a great place to be. And Luke records at the very beginning of chapter 13 that the church in Antioch was praying and fasting. And the Holy Spirit told them to set apart Barnabas and Paul for the work that he was going to call them to do. In fact, in chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Tell us that the church laid hands on them prayed for them, and sent them on their way. Let me say that again. The church laid hands on them, prayed for them, and sent them on their way. This is kind of where we get our model. When we go to send missionary teams out into the mission field, we bring them up on the platform, we, we touch them, we lay hands on them, and we pray for them. And we dedicate them in the name of the Lord for the work that God is calling them to do. And then we send them on their way, just like this church in Antioch was doing for Barnabas, Paul, and for Mark. Well, tonight we're going to talk about Paul's first missionary journey, and then we're going to talk about the first council of the church in Jerusalem. Along the way, something happened um, that caused a stir within the early church, and the first council church council in Jerusalem had to address this issue. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Well, Paul and Barnabas, they set off along with Mark and they set sail for Cyprus. So they come from Jerusalem. They come up the coast 300 miles to Antioch. They go up the Orontes River, catch a, uh, a sail ship from the Mediterranean coast, and then they sail to Cyprus. From there, they travel across the island of Cyprus. They go to Salmis, uh, 
and then to Paphos. And in Paphos, Paul and Barnabas caught another ship and sailed across the Mediterranean Sea to Pamphylia, which is actually part of Galatia. Now, at that point, when they're leaving Pampho, Paphos, um, Mark decides he's going to go back to Jerusalem. The Bible doesn't tell us why. It only says that he left them along the, the journey right there. Barnabas and Paul, they continue on their journey to Pamphylia. Um, but that is going to raise some contention between Barnabas and Paul in the future in the book of Acts. Well, from there, they go to Perga and they travel uh, to Pisidia. And there's a map that you should be able to follow here. And you can follow along when I talk. Because basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the first half of their, their trip. And you can see that they travel across Cyprus from Salmis to Paphos. They go from Perga to Pisidia, where they're met great opposition from the gospel by the Jews. And from Pisidia, they travel to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And in Iconium, they had to flee for fear of being killed, persecution. In Lystra, the people uh, greeted them at first and thought that, that Paul and Barnabas were gods. And they tried to worship them. And then eventually, they dragged Paul out of the city and they stoned him and left him to die. And I, I just imagine what Paul was going through because earlier in the book of Acts, he was there witnessing the stoning of Stephen. And now he is the one being stoned. So I, I imagine what that did to him emotionally to be on the receiving end of that stoning now. And this is where we pick up tonight's lesson when Paul and Barnabas are traveling to Derby. And so turn in your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 14, and we're actually going to start in verse 21. And here we find our missionaries. They're in, kind of in the middle of their leg of their journey, and so far they've met a lot of resistance. But here's the thing. As much opposition as they've met, they were equally successful in winning people to the gospel of Christ. You know, the work of the Holy Spirit called them to was very successful, but it wasn't without trial. It wasn't without difficulty. And this is where we're going to start our lesson for tonight. So chapter 14, book of Acts, and we're going to pick it up in verse 21. And this is the return to Antioch. And so they preached the gospel in the city and won a large number of disciples. This is in uh, Derby. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to maintain true to their faith. Now, Paul and Barnabas, they went back the same way that they came from Derby to uh, Iconium and to Lystra. And even though they met opposition there, their mission was not finished in these cities because they felt that they had a great responsibility to the new believers in these cities. And remembering what it was like for me 16 years ago to be a new believer, I didn't know anything and I was nervous about being a new believer. I really stuck very closely to the guys that God brought me at our church that were mentors for me and they were mature believers. I, I clung to them because I wasn't sure what to do and I needed mature believers around me to help me guide me through the journey of being a new believer. Well, Paul and Barnabas felt responsible for those new believers. So they, and they also demonstrated us um, for us that new believers need care. They really need care. And even us at New Life, when we find out that people are new believers, we really should envelop them. We really should get them involved in discipleship and really um, surround them so that they feel welcomed and they know that they're not alone going through this new journey that they are on. And no matter how inconvenient and no matter how uncomfortable we may feel, it is also our responsibility to nurture new believers as well, just like Paul and Barnabas did to these cities. Now, on the last half of verse 22, 
It tells us this, we must go through many hardships to endure, to enter the kingdom of God. They're saying, even though we're going through this stuff at these cities where we were persecuted, Paul was stoned and left for dead, it is still worth it. Preaching the gospel and seeing these Gentiles and these Jews come to Christ and start living on purpose for Jesus Christ. You know, it's a fact that churches grow under spirit-led leadership, and this is including pastors and lay leaders. Well, they were helping these new believers get organized with spiritual leaders. That's why they went back to get the church set up in these cities and get these um, spiritual leaders in place to help nurture and to help mature these new believers, help them grow into mature believers. You know, I just want to tell you, we can't do what we do at New Life without the leading of the Holy Spirit, God's Word, and prayer. You know, everything that we have done this year, especially this last four months, you know, has been filtered through hours and hours and hours of prayer and seeking the Holy Spirit for guidance. We can't do what we do. We can't guide effectively without praying, without seeking God's word for wisdom and guidance, and without being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, there's an old saying that says, don't put your pastor on a pedestal, put him on a prayer list. And please, please, please put us on your prayer lists. You know, Include us in your daily prayers. We can't do what we do without your prayers as well. You know, and I just want to say from myself and from the other pastors, from the part-time staff, and from the lay leaders at New Life, I just want to say thank you for praying for us through probably what has been the most toughest season of ministry that we have ever had as pastors and as, as part-time workers and as lay leaders at New Life than we have had in the last four months. This has been the most challenging season that we have ever seen in ministry. And thank you for, for praying for us. And I want to thank you in advance for your continued prayers because we cannot do what we do without you praying for us. So thank you for your prayers. Now, continuing tonight, in verse 24, it says, After going through um, Pisidah, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the doors of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So they came back to Antioch. And after they had finished that missionary journey, they landed back uh, in Antioch and they stayed there a long time. Well, it is suspected that this is where the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Galatians, because the cities that they visited in this first missionary journey of Paul is in the region of Galatia. And so this is where theologians suspect he wrote the book of Galatia before he returned to Jerusalem, but after his missionary journey. So right now in this time frame, you know, most of the theologians agree that Paul was writing to the churches in Iconia, Lystrum, Lystra, and Derby, And they also agree upon the fact that this letter was written to the Galatians before the council in Jerusalem in Acts 5, chapter 15, in Acts chapter 15, because in his letter to the Galatians, um, the question of whether Gentiles, Gentile believers should be required to follow Jewish law had not been resolved. That is exactly in chapter 15 what's going to happen. The council is going to come together and they're going to make a decision on this situation that has occurred in Antioch. And this is where we find ourselves, chapter 15. So turn to chapter 15. We're going to pick it up in verse 1. 
And this is the first church council in Jerusalem. Verse 1, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Now, let's kind of talk through this a little bit. The question of whether the Gentile believers should obey the law of Moses in order to be saved was extremely critical. This was a critical thing in the life of the church. This could have made or, or, made or broken the church here in this situation. So the, the council had to get together and talk about this. Now, the contention arose because there was a group of converted Pharisees. So they're Pharisees. They were former Pharisees that gave their life over to Christ. But, and they were called Judaizers. But what they were talking about was they were preaching a legalistic religion instead of a religion based on faith in Jesus Christ. A legalistic religion, meaning you had to do certain things to be saved, where faith in Christ is Jesus did it all on the cross. These converted Pharisees were trying to put rules upon faith. And this makes common sense because they're Pharisees, former Pharisees. So often Pharisees put their own rules on top of the law of Moses. We've learned that in the past. And they were doing what they had always done, what they have been taught to do by their leadership of the Pharisees. So if they would have won this debate, Christianity would have become a sect of Judaism instead of the fulfillment of God's plan for salvation for the entire world. And we're going to explain this a little bit more in detail. So this is verse 2b, second half of verse 2. Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, Warren talked about this a couple weeks in church. Everything in the Bible is going up to. Now, we know that Jerusalem is below Antioch, and in this it says they were appointed with other believers to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders. Um, they were sending them up, but they were actually traveling downward. They were traveling south. And the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told the Gentiles, told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. I love this, because they gave the church a missionary report. It's like... When our mission teams come back from the mission field and we give them an opportunity to share what they've done on a Wednesday night at Refuel, they give a missionary report. They tell us exactly what God uh, did on their trip and how God used them and, and what happened on their trip. So I just love this. Now in verse 5 it says, Then some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, these are the Judaizers, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So here's what we were just talking about. The Judaizers wanted the new believers to keep the law of Moses. They wanted the Gentile believers to basically convert to Judaism um, because they were having a hard time accepting the fact that God was was giving salvation to Gentiles. That's these Judaizers. They were having a hard time realizing this. So what they wanted them to do was, was convert to Judaism and follow everything that they were following. And they were having trouble shaking the old traditions that they were brought up with and embrace faith, just simple faith in Jesus Christ. So it continues in verse 6. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. Now, they didn't blow them off. They actually sat and considered this question. So after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. And he said, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips, 
the message of the gospel and believe. Remember, God you know, um, gave Peter this vision of the sheet dropping by all four corners, which was a representation that he was to share the gospel message with everybody. Um, and that um, this was practiced for him through uh, meeting Cornelius and his family. So it says, God, who knows the heart, showed and he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Peter's reminding of them of the lesson that he learned at Cornelius' house. When God gave him the opportunity to share the gospel message with a family, an entire family and friends of a Gentile, a Roman soldier, and lead them to Christ. So he's telling them uh, that I, got, I had to learn this lesson too. And that the gospel message, God's plan of salvation, is for Jews and Gentiles alike. In verse 10, it says, Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? I absolutely love this. Because Peter is telling them that even though they had the law of Moses, it was impossible for them and their ancestors to follow and maintain that law. They constantly drifted away from God time and time and time again. They had, you know, the, the act of circumcision all the way from Abraham. But they still, time after time after time, walked away from God and didn't follow that law. And so I hear Peter saying, so if our ancestors couldn't get this right, how are Gentiles going to get it right when they didn't even understand the law of Moses? They probably didn't even know Moses. So he's explaining to them that it's no longer necessary for that. God has a different plan. And he says right here in verse 11, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Salvation is achieved by grace and grace alone. It is not based on anything that we can do. It is based solely on what Jesus did on the cross. That is what salvation is based on. In verse 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul tell about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. This is the half-brother of Jesus. He spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, Peter, has described to us how God first intervened to choose, for, choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. So Paul and Barnabas, they gave many examples of how God's grace was given to the Gentiles and they were firsthand witnesses of the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Then James, Jesus' brother, gets up and he speaks and right here, you know, he's now an elder of the church. And Paul and Peter and Barnabas, they give compelling evidence of God's plan of salvation for all mankind. But then James gets up right here and he turns to the Word of God, which is the ultimate test of truth. And this is awesome. Listen to this, verse 16. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Let me say that again. Verse 17, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Things, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, say the Lord. Who does these things? Known from long ago. James is quoting the prophets Amos and Zechariah from a section of the Old Testament called the book of uh, of the minor prophets. So it's, it's from a section called the minor prophets, which we studied at Refuel some time ago. In verse 19, it is my judgment, this is James still talking, it is my judgment therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God, 
Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest time and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, let's, I just want to kind of simplify this a little bit. Now, James made a judgment call here that based on what they heard, what they talked about, through prayer, through God's Word, and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, James made a judgment call that the Gentile believers would not have to be circumcised, but they should stay away from the four pagan practices that he listed. And this ruling would be a compromise. Um, this would be done to keep unification between um, the believing Jews and the believing Gentiles. The Gentile believers would not have to be circumcised in order to be saved. They would be saved by grace and grace alone, but they're recommending that they, they follow these four practices, and that would be you know, abstaining, uh, that these four practices that James is asking them to abstain from would fall in line with the Jewish practices which would satisfy the Jewish believers. So it's unifying the, the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. Salvation is through Jesus Christ, but they're asking all the Jews and the Gentiles for these four practices. In verse 22, the council, they write a letter to the believers, the new believers in Antioch. And this is verse 22. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose from their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. Now, this very first council, they experienced difficulty, great difficulty in bringing together these two really diverse cultures. The Jews and the Gentiles, they had almost nothing in common. They had different histories, they had different uh, traditions, and they had different practices. Their decision of compromise um, it's what helped to unify the church in those early days. Their decision was based on their desire. This is their theology. The decision was based on their desire to portray God's love to all people. That's the theology behind their decision. They want to portray love to all people because the gospel is for all people. Now in verse 24, it says, We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubled your minds by what they said. These were the Judaizers. These were the converted Pharisees. And it says, So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Saul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You would be well to avoid these. Farewell. This is their only instruction to them. And this was designed to help the Jews and the Gentiles to live a life without sin by, by giving them a moral compass. That's what it was. It wasn't a set of rules to follow. It was a set of rules to help them to live a sinless life by giving them a moral compass to follow. It helped to unify their cultural differences. In verse 30, so the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. They were excited. The, the new believers, the Gentile believers in Antioch were excited that the church in Jerusalem and the council at the church in Jerusalem 
um, was looking out for their well-being and wanted to make sure they didn't stumble and fall. They were excited that, that mature believers were coming along them to guide them and to direct them. You know, matters of theology are very serious. In fact, churches can be destroyed because of different opinions of theology. We have seen this time and time again through history. We see it now in the churches. We've seen it in the Methodist church. We've seen it in the Presbyterian church. We've seen it in the Baptist church. Um, it's just these differences in theology can tear a church apart. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, the apostles and Paul and Barnabas and the church elders all relied on Scripture, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and prayer to make their decision in this first council in Jerusalem. You know, it's, in very, it's very important for us to use this same model when we are making difficult decisions within a church or, or we're making difficult decisions in our own personal lives. You know, it's the Word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit that should guide us in making the best decisions possible. Whether it's a decision that needs to be made within a church or it's a decision that needs to be made in our personal lives. This model is the only way to make sure that we are in line with God's will. Our personal opinions are always going to vary, but God's word never changes. It's everlasting. And the leading of the Holy Spirit will never fail to produce the very best outcome in any situation that we will face as a church or as individuals. So when we come down to these matters that, that really make a difference in what we do in our churches and in our lives, we need to rely on these three things that this council relied on to make this decision to unify the church and unify the Jews and the Gentiles. And those were the power of prayer. It is God's infallible word, and it is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Those three things will make sure that we are always, always in the will of God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for tonight's lesson. This is just packed full of information that we can use to grow to be the people that you need us to be. And I thank you from their examples, God, of how they relied on you, how they prayed without ceasing, and how they relied on the guidance of the Holy Spirit to make a choice that would not split the church in half. A church that is so young and a church that is so vulnerable. I thank you so much that you are there, that you are always hearing our prayers, and that you are constant and you never change. I thank you so much for everything that you are going to do through tonight's lesson and how you are going to speak to us, your people, and change us so that we can learn from these examples when we have to make difficult decisions in our futures. So God, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do, and mainly thank you for prayer, thank you for your word, and thank you for uh, our salvation in Jesus Christ, and thank you for the gift of the leading of the Holy Spirit. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a really blessed night, everybody.